Young Archimedes, a short story by Aldous Huxley. It was the view which finally made us take the place. True, the house had its disadvantages. It was a long way out of town and had no telephone. The rent was unduly high, the drainage system poor. On windy nights, when the ill-fitting panes were rattling so furiously in the window frames that you could fancy yourself in an hotel omnibus, the electric light, for some mysterious reason, used invariably to go out and leave you in the noisy dark. There was a splendid bathroom, but the electric pump, which was supposed to send up water from the rainwater tanks in the terrace, did not work. Punctually, every autumn, the drinking well ran dry, and our landlady was a liar and a cheat. But these are the little disadvantages of every hired house all over the world. For Italy, they were not really at all serious. I have seen plenty of houses which had them all and a hundred others without possessing the compensating advantages of ours. The southward-facing garden and terrace for the winter and spring, the large, cool rooms against the midsummer heat, the hilltop air and freedom from mosquitoes, and finally, the view. And what a view it was. Or rather, what a succession of views. For it was different every day. And without stirring from the house, one had the impression of an incessant change of scene. All the delights of travel without its fatigues. There were autumn days when all the valleys were filled with mist, and the crests of the Apennines rose darkly out of a flat white lake. There were days when the mist invaded even our hilltop, and we were enveloped in a soft vapour in which the mist-coloured olive trees that sloped away below our windows towards the valley disappeared as though into their own spiritual essence. And the only firm and definite things in the small, dim world within which we found ourselves confined were the two tall black cypresses growing on a little projecting terrace a hundred feet down the hill. Black, sharp and solid, they stood there, twin pillars of Hercules at the extremity of the known universe, and beyond them there was only pale cloud, and round them only the cloudy olive trees. These were the wintry days, but there were days of spring and autumn, days unchangingly cloudless, or, more lovely still, made various by the huge floating shapes of vapour that snowy above the far away snow-capped mountains gradually unfolded against the pale bright blue enormous heroic gestures. And in the height of the sky the bellying draperies, the swans, the aerial marbles, hewed and left unfinished by gods grown tired of creation almost before they had begun, drifted sleeping along the wind, changing form as they moved, and the sun would come and go behind them, and now the town in the valley would fade and almost vanish in the shadow, and now, like an immense fretted jewel between the hills, it would glow as though by its own light. And looking across the nearer tributary valley that wound from below our crest, down towards the Arno, looking over the low, dark shoulder of hill on whose extreme promontory stood the towered church of San Miniato, one saw the huge dome airily hanging on its ribs of masonry, the square campanile, the sharp spire of Santa Croce, and the canopied tower of the Signoria, rising above the intricate maze of houses, distinct and brilliant, like small treasures carved out of precious stones. For a moment only, and then their light would fade away once more, and the travelling beam would pick out, among the indigo hills beyond, a single golden crest. There were days when the air was wet with past, or with approaching rain, and all the distances seemed miraculously near and clear. The olive trees detached themselves one from another on the distant slopes. The faraway villages were lovely and pathetic, like the most exquisite small toys. There were days in summertime, days of impending thunder when, bright and sunlit against huge bellying masses of black and purple, the hills and the white houses shone, as it were, precariously, in a dying splendour, on the brink of some fearful calamity. How the hills changed and varied. Every day and every hour of the day, almost, they were different. There would be moments when, looking across the plain of Florence, one would see only a dark blue silhouette against the sky.
The scene had no depth. There was only a hanging curtain painted flatly with the symbols of mountains. And then, suddenly almost, with the passing of a cloud, or when the sun had declined to a certain level in the sky, the flat scene transformed itself. And where there had been only a painted curtain, now there were ranges behind ranges of hills, graduated tone after tone from brown or grey or a green gold to faraway blue. Shapes that a moment before had been fused together indiscriminately into a single mass now came apart into their constituents. Fiesole, which had seemed only a spur of Monte Morello, now revealed itself as the jutting headland of another system of hills, divided from the nearest bastions of its greater neighbour by a deep and shadowy valley. At noon, during the heats of summer, the landscape became dim, powdery, vague, and almost colourless under the midday sun. The hills disappeared into the trembling fringes of the sky. But as the afternoon wore on, the landscape emerged again. It dropped its anonymity. It climbed back out of nothingness into form and life. And its life, as the sun sank and slowly sank through the long afternoon, grew richer, grew more intense with every moment. The level light, with its attendant long, dark shadows, laid bare, so to speak, the anatomy of the land. The hills, each western escarpment shining, and each slope averted from the sunlight profoundly shadowed, became massive, jutty, and solid. Little folds and dimples in the seemingly even ground revealed themselves. Eastward from our hilltop, across the plain of the Amma, a great bluff cast its ever-increasing shadow. In the surrounding brightness of the valley, a whole town lay eclipsed within it. And as the sun expired on the horizon, the further hills flushed in its warm light, till their illumined flanks were the colour of tawny roses. But the valleys were already filled with the blue mist of evening, and it mounted, mounted. The fire went out of the western windows of the populous slopes. Only the crests were still alight, and at last they too were all extinct. The mountains faded and fused together again into a flat painting of mountains against the pale evening sky. In a little while it was night, and if the moon were full, a ghost of the dead scene still haunted the horizons. Changeful in its beauty, this wide landscape always preserved a quality of humanness and domestication, which made it, to my mind at any rate, the best of all landscapes to live with. Day by day, one travelled through its different beauties, but the journey, like our ancestors' grand tour, was always a journey through civilization. For all its mountains, its steep slopes and deep valleys, the Tuscan scene is dominated by its inhabitants. They have cultivated every rood of ground that can be cultivated, their houses are thickly scattered even over the hills, and the valleys are populous. Solitary on the hilltop, one is not alone in a wilderness. Man's traces are across the country, and already one feels it with satisfaction as one looks out across it. For centuries, for thousands of years, it has been his, submissive, tamed and humanised. The wide, blank moorlands, the sands, the forests of innumerable trees, these are places for occasional visitation, healthful to the spirit which submits itself to them for not too long. But fiendish influences as well as divine haunt these total solitudes. The vegetative life of plants and things is alien and hostile to the human. Men cannot live at ease except where they have mastered their surroundings and where their accumulated lives outnumber and outweigh the vegetative lives about them. Stripped of its dark woods, planted, terraced and tilled almost to the mountain's tops, the Tuscan landscape is humanised and safe. Sometimes upon those who live in the midst of it, there comes a longing for some place that is solitary, inhuman, lifeless, or peopled only with alien life. But the longing is soon satisfied, and one is glad to return to the civilised and submissive scene. I found that house on the hilltop the ideal dwelling place, for there, safe in the midst of a humanised landscape, one was yet alone. One could be as solitary as one liked. Neighbours whom one never sees at close quarters are the ideal and perfect neighbours.
Our nearest neighbours, in terms of physical proximity, lived very near. We had two sets of them, as a matter of fact, almost in the same house with us. One was the peasant family, who lived in a wing, long, low building, part dwelling house, part stables, storerooms and cowsheds, adjoining the villa. Our other neighbours, intermittent neighbours, however, for they only ventured out of town every now and then, during the most flawless weather, were the owners of the villa, who had reserved for themselves the smaller wing of the huge L-shaped house, a mere dozen rooms or so, leaving the remaining eighteen or twenty to us. They were a curious couple, our proprietors. An old husband, grey, listless, tottering, seventy at least, and a signora of about forty, short, very plump, with tiny fat hands and feet, and a pair of very large, very dark black eyes, which she used with all the skill of a born comedian. Her vitality, if you could have harnessed it and made it do some useful work, would have supplied a whole town with electric light. The physicists talk of deriving energy from the atom. They would be more profitably employed nearer home in discovering some way of tapping those enormous stores of vital energy which accumulate in unemployed women of sanguine temperament and which, in the present imperfect state of social and scientific organisation, vent themselves in ways that are generally so deplorable, in interfering with other people's affairs, in working up emotional scenes, in thinking about love and making it, and in bothering men till they cannot get on with their work. Signora Bondi got rid of her superfluous energy, among other ways, by doing in her tenants. The old gentleman, who was a retired merchant with a reputation for the most perfect rectitude, was allowed to have no dealings with us. When we came to see the house, it was the wife who showed us round. It was she who, with a lavish display of charm, with irresistible rollings of the eyes, expatiated on the merits of the place, sang the praises of the electric pump, glorified the bathroom, considering which, she insisted, the rent was remarkably moderate. And when we suggested calling in a surveyor to look over the house, earnestly begged us, as though our well-being were her only consideration, not to waste our money unnecessarily in doing anything so superfluous. After all, she said, we are honest people. I wouldn't dream of letting you the ghee house, except in perfect condition. Have confidence. And she looked at me with an appealing, pained expression in her magnificent eyes, as though begging me not to insult her by my coarse suspiciousness and leaving us no time to pursue the subject of surveyors any further, she began assuring us that our little boy was the most beautiful angel she had ever seen. By the time our interview with Signora Bondi was at an end, we had definitely decided to take the house. Charming woman, I said as we left the house. But I think that Elizabeth was not quite so certain of it as I. Then the pump episode began. On the evening of our arrival in the house, we switched on the electricity. The pump made a very professional whirring noise, but no water came out of the taps in the bathroom. We looked at one another doubtfully. Charming woman, Elizabeth raised her eyebrows. We asked for interviews, but somehow the old gentleman could never see us, and the signora was invariably out or indisposed. We left notes. They were never answered. In the end, we found that the only method of communicating with our landlords, who were living in the same house with us, was to go down into Florence and send a registered express letter to them. For this, they had to sign two separate receipts, and even, if we chose to pay forty centimes more, a third incriminating document, which was then returned to us. There could be no pretending, as there always was with ordinary letters or notes, that the communication had never been received. We began at last to get answers to our complaints. The signora, who wrote all the letters, started by telling us that naturally the pump didn't work, as the cisterns were empty, owing to the long drought. I had to walk three miles to the post office in order to register my letter, reminding her that there had been a violent thunderstorm only last Wednesday, and that the tanks were consequently more than half full. The answer came back. Bath water had not been guaranteed in the contract, and if I wanted it, why hadn't I had the pump looked at before I took the house? 
Another walk into town to ask the signora next door whether she remembered her adjurations to us to have confidence in her and to inform her that the existence in a house of a bathroom was in itself an implicit guarantee of bath water. The reply to that was that the signora couldn't continue to have communications with people who wrote so rudely to her. After that, I put the matter into the hands of a lawyer. Two months later, the pump was actually replaced, but we had to serve a writ on the lady before she gave in, and the costs were considerable. One day, towards the end of the episode, I met the old gentleman in the road, taking his big Maremon dog for a walk or being taken, rather, for a walk by the dog, for where the dog pulled the old gentleman had perforce to follow, and when it stopped to smell or scratch the ground, or leave against a gatepost its visiting card or an offensive challenge, patiently, at his end of the leash, the old man had to wait. I passed him standing at the side of the road, a few hundred yards below our house, the dog was sniffing at the roots of one of the twin cypresses, which grew one on either side of the entry to a farm. I heard the beast growling indignantly to itself, as though it scented an intolerable insult. Old Signor Bondi, leashed to his dog, was waiting. The knees inside the tubular grey trousers were slightly bent. Leaning on his cane, he stood gazing mournfully and vacantly at the view. The whites of his old eyes were discoloured like ancient billiard balls. In the grey, deeply wrinkled face, his nose was dyspeptically red. His white moustache, ragged and yellowing at the fringes, drooped in a melancholy curve. In his black tie, he wore a very large diamond. Perhaps that was what Signora Bondi had found so attractive about him. I took off my hat as I approached. The old man stared at me absently, and it was only when I was already almost past him that he recollected who I was. Wait, he called after me. Wait! And he hastened down the road in pursuit. Taken utterly by surprise and at a disadvantage, for it was engaged in retorting to the affront imprinted on the cypress roots, the dog permitted itself to be jerked after him. Too much astonished to be anything but obedient, it followed its master. Wait! I waited. My dear sir, said the old gentleman, catching me by the lapel of my coat and blowing most disagreeably in my face. I want to apologise. He looked around him, as though afraid that even here he might be overheard. I want to apologise, he went on, about that wretched pump business. I assure you that if it had been only my affair, I'd have put the thing right as soon as you asked. You were quite right. A bathroom is an implicit guarantee of bath water. I saw from the first that we should have no chance if it came to court, and besides, I think one ought to treat one's tenants as handsomely as one can afford to. But my wife, he lowered his voice, the fact is that she likes this sort of thing, even when she knows that she's in the wrong and must lose. And besides, she hoped, I dare say, that you'd get tired of asking and have the job done yourself. I told her from the first that we ought to give in, but she wouldn't listen. You see, she enjoys it. Still, now she sees that it must be done. In the course of the next two or three days, you'll be having your bath water. But I thought I'd just like to tell you how. But the Maremano, which had recovered by this time from its surprise of a moment since, suddenly bounded, growling, up the road. The old gentleman tried to hold the beast, strained at the leash, tottered unsteadily, then gave way and allowed himself to be dragged off. How sorry I am, he went on, as he receded from me, that this little misunderstanding. But it was no use. Goodbye. He smiled politely, made a little deprecating gesture, as though he had suddenly remembered a pressing engagement and had no time to explain what it was. Goodbye. He took off his hat and abandoned himself completely to the dog. A week later, the water really did begin to flow, and the day after our first bath, Signora Bondi, dressed in dove-grey satin and wearing all her pearls, came to call. Is it peace now? she asked with a charming frankness as she shook hands. We assured her that, so far as we were concerned, it certainly was. But why did you write me such dreadfully rude letters? she said. 
turning on me a reproachful glance that ought to have moved the most ruthless malefactor to contrition. And then that writ. How could you? To a lady. I mumbled something about the pump and our wanting baths. But how could you expect me to listen to you while you were in that mood? Why didn't you set about it differently, politely, charmingly? She smiled at me and dropped her fluttering eyelids. I thought it best to change the conversation. It is disagreeable, when one is in the right, to be made to appear in the wrong. A few weeks later we had a letter, duly registered and by express messenger, in which the signora asked us whether we proposed to renew our lease, which was only for six months, and notifying us that if we did, the rent would be raised 25% in consideration of the improvements which had been carried out. We thought ourselves lucky, at the end of much bargaining, to get the lease renewed for a whole year with an increase in the rent of only 15%. It was chiefly for the sake of the view that we put up with these intolerable extortions, but we had found other reasons, after a few days' residence, for liking the house. Of these, the most cogent was that, in the peasant's youngest child, we had discovered what seemed the perfect playfellow for our own small boy. Between little Guido, for that was his name, and the youngest of his brothers and sisters, there was a gap of six or seven years. His two elder brothers worked with their father in the fields. Since the time of the mother's death, two or three years before we knew them, the eldest sister had ruled the house, and the younger, who had just left school, helped her, and in between. Wiles kept an eye on Guido, who by this time, however, needed very little looking after for he was between six and seven years old and as precocious, self-assured and responsible as the children of the poor, left as they are to themselves almost from the time they can walk, generally are. Though fully two and a half years older than little Robin, and at that age thirty months are crammed with half a lifetime's experience, Guido took no undue advantage of his superior intelligence and strength. I have never seen a child more patient, tolerant and untyrannical. He never laughed at Robin for his clumsy efforts to imitate his own prodigious feats. He did not tease or bully, but helped his small companion when he was in difficulties and explained when he could not understand. In return, Robin adored him, regarded him as the model and perfect big boy, and slavishly imitated him in every way he could. These attempts of Robin's to imitate his companion were often exceedingly ludicrous. For by an obscure psychological law, words and actions in themselves quite serious become comic as soon as they are copied, and the more accurately, if the imitation is a deliberate parody, the funnier, for an overloaded imitation of someone we know does not make us laugh so much as one that is almost indistinguishably like the original. The bad imitation is only ludicrous when it is a piece of sincere and earnest flattery which does not quite come off. Robin's imitations were mostly of this kind, his heroic and unsuccessful attempts to perform the feats of strength and skill which Guido could do with ease were at exquisitely comic, and his careful, long-drawn imitations of Guido's habits and mannerisms were no less amusing. Most ludicrous of all, because most earnestly undertaken and most incongruous in the imitator, were Robin's impersonations of Guido in the pensive mood. Guido was a thoughtful child, given to brooding and sudden abstractions. One would find him sitting in a corner by himself, chin in hand, elbow on knee, plunged to all appearances in the profoundest meditation. And sometimes, even in the midst of his play, he would suddenly break off, to stand, his hands behind his back, frowning and staring at the ground. When this happened, Robin became overawed and a little disquieted. In a puzzled silence, he looked at his companion. Guido, he would say softly. Guido. But Guido was generally too much preoccupied to answer, and Robin, not venturing to insist, would creep near him and throwing himself as nearly as possible into Guido's attitude, standing Napoleonically, his hands clasped behind him, or sitting in the posture of Michelangelo's Lorenzo the Magnificent, would try to meditate too. Every few seconds, he would turn his bright blue eyes towards the elder child to see whether he was doing it quite right. 
but at the end of a minute he began to grow impatient. Meditation wasn't his strong point. Guido, he called again, and louder, Guido, and he would take him by the hand and try to pull him away. Sometimes Guido roused himself from his reverie and went back to the interrupted game. Sometimes he paid no attention. Melancholy, perplexed, Robin had to take himself off to play by himself, and Guido would go on sitting or standing there, quite still, and his eyes, if one looked into them, were beautiful in their grave and pensive calm. They were large eyes, set far apart, and what was strange in a dark-haired Italian child, of a luminous, pale, blue-grey colour. They were not always grave and calm, as in these pensive moments. When he was playing, when he talked or laughed, they lit up, and the surface of those clear, pale lakes of thought seemed, as it were, to be shaken into brilliant, sun-flashing ripples. Above those eyes was a beautiful forehead, high and steep, and domed in a curve that was like the subtle curve of a rose petal. The nose was straight, the chin small and rather pointed, the mouth drooped a little sadly at the corners. I have a snapshot of the two children sitting together on the parapet of the terrace. Guido sits almost facing the camera, but looking a little to one side and downwards. His hands are crossed in his lap and his expression, his attitude are thoughtful, grave and meditative. It is Guido in one of those moods of abstraction into which he would pass even at the height of laughter and play, quite suddenly and completely, as though he had all at once taken it into his head to go away and had left the silent and beautiful body behind, like an empty house, to wait for his return. And by his side sits little Robin, turning to look up at him, his face half averted from the camera, but the curve of his cheek showing that he is laughing. One little raised hand is caught at the top of a gesture, the other clutches at Guido's sleeve, as though he were urging him to come away and play. And the legs dangling from the parapet have been seen by the blinking at instrument in the midst of an impatient wriggle. He is on the point of slipping down and running off to play hide-and-seek in the garden. All the essential characteristics of both the children are in that little snapshot. If Robin were not Robin, Elizabeth used to say, I could almost wish he were Guido. And even at that time, when I took no particular interest in the child, I agreed with her. Guido seemed to me one of the most charming little boys I had ever seen. We were not alone in admiring him. Signora Bondi, when, in those cordial intervals between our quarrels, she came to call, was constantly speaking of him. Such a beautiful, beautiful child she would exclaim with enthusiasm. It's really a waste that he should belong to peasants who can't afford to dress him properly. If he were mine, I should put him into black velvet, or little white knickers, and a white knitted silk jersey with a red line at the collar and cuffs, or perhaps a white sailor suit would be pretty. And in winter, a little fur coat with a squirrel skin cap and possibly Russian boots. Her imagination was running away with her and I'd let his hair grow like a page's, and have it just curled up a little at the tips, and a straight fringe across his forehead. Everyone would turn round and stare after us if I took him out with me in Via Tornabuoni. What you want, I should have liked to tell her, is not a child. It's a clockwork doll or a performing monkey. But I did not say so, partly because I could not think of the Italian for a clockwork doll, and partly because I did not want to risk having the rent raised another 15%. Ah, if only I had a little boy like that. She sighed and modestly dropped her eyelids. I adore children. I sometimes think of adopting one, that is, if my husband would allow it. I thought of the poor old gentleman being dragged along at the heels of his big white dog and inwardly smiled. But I don't know if he would, the signora was continuing. I don't know if he would. She was silent for a moment as though considering a new idea. A few days later, when we were sitting in the garden after luncheon, drinking our coffee, Guido's father, instead of passing with a nod and the usual cheerful good day, halted in front of us and began to talk. He was a fine, handsome man, not very tall, but well-proportioned, quick and elastic in his movements, and full of life. 
He had a thin brown face, featured like a Roman's and lit by a pair of the most intelligent-looking grey eyes I ever saw. They exhibited almost too much intelligence when, as not infrequently happened, he was trying, with an assumption of perfect frankness and a childlike innocence, to take one in or get something out of one. Delighting in itself, the intelligence shone there mischievously. The face might be ingenuous, impassive, almost imbecile in its expression. But the eyes on these occasions gave him completely away. One knew, when they glittered like that, that one would have to be careful. Today, however, there was no dangerous light in them. He wanted nothing out of us, nothing of any value, only advice, which is a commodity, he knew, that most people are only too happy to cool part with. But he wanted advice on what was, for us, rather a delicate subject, on Signora Bondi. Carlo had often complained to us about her. The old man is good, he told us, very good and kind indeed, which meant, I dare say, among other things, that he could easily be swindled. But his wife, well, the woman was a beast, and he would tell us stories of her insatiable rapacity. She was always claiming more than the half of the produce which, by the laws of the metayage system, was the proprietor's due. He complained of her suspiciousness. She was forever accusing him of sharp practices, of downright stealing. Him, he struck his breast, the soul of honesty. He complained of her short-sighted avarice. She wouldn't spend enough on manure, wouldn't buy him another cow, wouldn't have electric light installed in the stables, and we had sympathised, but cautiously, without expressing too strong an opinion on the subject. The Italians are wonderfully non-committal in their speech. They will give nothing away to an interested person until they are quite certain that it is right and necessary and above all, when safe to do so. We had lived long enough among them to imitate their caution. What we said to Carlo would be sure, sooner or later, to get back to Signora Bondi. There was nothing to be gained by unnecessarily embittering our relations with the lady, only another 15%, very likely, to be lost. Today, he wasn't so much complaining as feeling perplexed, the signora had sent for him, it seemed, and asked him how he would like it if she were to make an offer, it was all very hypothetical in the cautious Italian style, to adopt little Guido. Carlo's first instinct had been to say that he wouldn't like it at all, but an answer like that would have been too coarsely committal. He had preferred to say that he would think about it, and now he was asking for our advice. Do what you think best, was what in effect we replied but we gave it distantly but distinctly to be understood that we didn't think that Signora Bondi would make a very good foster mother for the child. And Carlo was inclined to agree. Besides, he was very fond of the boy. But the thing is, he concluded, rather gloomily, that if she has really set her heart on getting hold of the child, there's nothing she won't do to get him. Nothing. He too, I could see, would have liked the physicists to start on unemployed, childless women of sanguine temperament before they tried to tackle the atom. Still, I reflected, as I watched him striding away along the terrace, singing powerfully from a brazen gullet as he went, there was force there, there was life enough in those elastic limbs, behind those bright grey eyes, to put up a good fight even against the accumulated vital energies of Signora Bondi. It was a few days after this that my gramophone and two or three boxes of records arrived from England. They were a great comfort to us on the hilltop, providing as they did the only thing in which that spiritually fertile solitude, otherwise a perfect Swiss family Robinson's Island, was lacking. Music. There is not much music to be heard nowadays in Florence. The times when Dr. Burney could tour through Italy, listening to an unending succession of new operas, symphonies, quartets, cantatas, are gone. Gone are the days when a learned musician, inferior only to the Reverend Father Martini of Bologna, could admire what the peasants sang and the strolling players thrummed and scraped on their instruments. I have travelled for weeks through the peninsula, and hardly heard a note that was not Salome or the fascist's song, rich in nothing else that makes life agreeable or even supportable. The northern metropolises are rich in music, 
That is perhaps the only inducement that a reasonable man can find for living there. The other attractions, organized gaiety, people, miscellaneous conversation, the social pleasures, what are those, after all, but an expensive spirit that buys nothing in return? And then the cold, the darkness, the mouldering dirt, the damp and squalor. No, where there is no necessity that retains, music can be the only inducement. And that, thanks to the ingenious Edison, can now be taken about in a box and unpacked in whatever solitude one chooses to visit. One can live at Benin or Nuneaton or Toza in the Sahara, and still hear Mozart quartets and selections from the well-tempered clavichord and the Fifth Symphony and the Brahms clarinet quintet and motets by Palestrina. Carlo, who had gone down to the station with his mule and cart to fetch the packing case, was vastly interested in the machine. One will hear some music again, he said, as he watched me unpacking the gramophone and the discs. It is difficult to do much oneself. Still, I reflected, he managed to do a good deal. On warm nights we used to hear him, where he sat at the door of his house, playing his guitar and softly singing. The eldest boy shrilled out the melody on the mandolin, and sometimes the whole family would join in, and the darkness would be filled with their passionate, throaty singing. Pierre de Grotta songs they mostly sang, and the voices drooped slurringly from note to note, lazily climbed or jerked themselves with sudden sobbing emphases from one tone to another. At a distance and under the stars, the effect was not unpleasing. Before the war, he went on, in normal times, and Carlo had a hope, even a belief, that the normal times were coming back and that life would soon be as cheap and easy as it had been in the days before the flood. I used to go and listen to the operas at the Politeama. Ah, they were magnificent, but it costs five lire now to get in. Too much, I agreed. Have you got Trovatore? he asked. I shook my head. Rigoletto? I'm afraid not. Bohème? Fanciula del West? Pagliacci? I had to go on disappointing him. Not even Norma? Or the Barbiere? I put on Battistini in La Ci Darem out of Don Giovanni. He agreed that the singing was good, but I could see that he didn't much like the music. Why not? He found it difficult to explain. It's not like Pagliacci, he said at last. Not palpitating, I suggested, using a word with which I was sure he would be familiar, for it occurs in every Italian political speech and patriotic leading article. Not palpitating, he agreed, and I reflected that it is precisely by the difference between Pagliacci and Don Giovanni between the palpitating and the non-palpitating, that modern musical taste is separated from the old. The corruption of the best, I thought, is the worst. Beethoven taught music to palpitate with his intellectual and spiritual passion. It has gone on palpitating ever since, but with the passion of inferior men. Indirectly, I thought, Beethoven is responsible for Parsifal, Pagliacci, and the Poem of Fire still more indirectly for Samson and Delilah and Ivy, cling to me. Mozart's melodies may be brilliant, memorable, infectious, but they don't palpitate, don't catch you between wind and water, don't send the listener off into erotic ecstasies. Carlo and his elder children found my gramophone, I'm afraid, rather a disappointment. They were too polite, however, to say so openly, they merely ceased, after the first day or two, to take any interest in the machine and the music it played. They preferred the guitar and their own singing. Guido, on the other hand, was immensely interested. And he liked, not the cheerful dance tunes, to whose sharp rhythms our little Robin loved to go stamping round and round the room, pretending that he was a whole regiment of soldiers, but the genuine stuff. The first record he heard, I remember, was that of the slow movement of Bach's concerto in D minor for two violins. That was the disc I put on the turntable as soon as Carlo had left me. It seemed to me, so to speak, the most musical piece of music with which I could refresh my long, parched mind, the coolest and clearest of all draughts. The movement had just got under way, 
and was beginning to unfold its pure and melancholy beauties in accordance with the laws of the most exacting intellectual logic, when the two children, Guido in front and little Robin breathlessly following, came clattering into the room from the loggia. Guido came to a halt in front of the gramophone and stood there, motionless, listening. His pale blue-grey eyes opened themselves wide. Making a little nervous gesture that I had often noticed in him before, he plucked at his lower lip with his thumb and forefinger. He must have taken a deep breath, for I noticed that after listening for a few seconds, he sharply expired and drew in a fresh gulp of air. For an instant, he looked at me, a questioning, astonished, rapturous look, gave a little laugh that ended in a kind of nervous shudder and turned back towards the source of the incredible sounds. Slavishly imitating his elder comrade, Robin had also taken up his stand in front of the gramophone and in exactly the same position, glancing at Guido from time to time to make sure that he was doing everything down to plucking at his lip in the correct way. But after a minute or so he became bored. Soldiers, he said, turning to me. I want soldiers, like in London. He remembered the ragtime and the jolly marches round and round the room. I put my fingers to my lips. Afterwards, I whispered. Robin managed to remain silent and still for perhaps another twenty seconds. Then he seized Guido by the arm, shouting, Vieni, Guido! Soldiers! Soldati! Vieni, giuocare, soldati! It was then, for the first time, that I saw Guido impatient. Vai! he whispered angrily, slapped at Robin's clutching hand and pushed him roughly away. And he leaned a little closer to the instrument as though to make up by yet intenser listening for what the interruption had caused him to miss. Robin looked at him, astonished. Such a thing had never happened before. Then he burst out crying and came to me for consolation. When the quarrel was made up and Guido was sincerely repentant, was as nice as he knew how to be when the music had stopped and his mind was free to think of Robin once more, I asked him how he liked the music. He said he thought it was beautiful, but bello in Italian is too vague a word, too easily and frequently uttered, to mean very much. What did you like best? I insisted, for he had seemed to enjoy it so much that I was curious to find out what had really impressed him. He was silent for a moment, pensively frowning. Well he said at last. I like the bit that went like this. And he hummed a long phrase. And then there's the other thing singing at the same time. But what are those things? He interrupted himself. That sing like that. They're called violins, I said. Violins. He nodded. Well, the other violin goes like this. He hummed again. Why can't one sing both at once? And what is in that box? What makes it make that noise? The child poured out his questions. I answered him as best I could, showing him the little spirals on the disc, the needle, the diaphragm. I told him to remember how the string of the guitar trembled when one plucked it. Sound is a shaking in the air, I told him, and I tried to explain how those shakings get printed on the black disc. Guido listened to me very gravely, nodding from time to time. I had the impression that he understood perfectly well everything I was saying. By this time, however, poor Robin was so dreadfully bored that in pity for him I had to send the two children out into the garden to play. Guido went obediently, but I could see that he would have preferred to stay indoors and listen to more music. A little while later, when I looked out, he was hiding in the dark recesses of the big bay tree roaring like a lion, and Robin, laughing, but a little nervously, as though he were afraid that the horrible noise might possibly turn out, after all, to be the roaring of a real lion, was beating the bush with a stick and shouting, Come out! Come out! I want to shoot you! After lunch, when Robin had gone upstairs for his afternoon sleep, he reappeared. May I listen to the music now? he asked and for an hour he sat there in front of the instrument, his head cocked slightly on one side, listening while I put on one disc after another. Thenceforward he came every afternoon.
Very soon he knew all my library of records, had his preferences and dislikes, and could ask for what he wanted by humming the principal theme. I don't like that one, he said of Strauss's Till Eulen Spiegel. It's like what we sing in our house. Not really like, you know, but somehow rather like, all the same. You understand? He looked at us perplexedly and appealingly, as though begging us to understand what he meant and so save him from going on explaining. We nodded. Guido went on. And then, he said, the end doesn't seem to come properly out of the beginning. It's not like the one you played the first time. He hummed a bar or two from the slow movement of Bach's D minor concerto. It isn't, I suggested, like saying, all little boys like playing. Guido is a little boy, therefore Guido likes playing. He frowned. Yes, perhaps that's it, he said at last. The one you played first is more like that. But you know, he added, with an excessive regard for truth, I don't like playing as much as Robin does. Wagner was among his dislikes. So was Debussy. When I played the record of one of Debussy's arabesques, he said, why does he say the same thing over and over again? He ought to say something new, or go on, or make the thing grow. Can't he think of anything different? But he was less censorious about the après-midi d'un phone. The things have beautiful voices, he said. Mozart overwhelmed him with delight. The duet from Don Giovanni, which his father had found insufficiently palpitating, enchanted Guido, but he preferred the quartets and the orchestral pieces. I like music, he said, better than singing. Most people, I reflected, like singing better than music, are more interested in the executant than in what he executes, and find the impersonal orchestra less moving than the soloist. The touch of the pianist is the human touch, and the soprano's high C is the personal note. It is for the sake of this touch, that note, that audiences fill the concert halls. Guido, however, preferred music. True, he liked La Ci Darem. He liked De Vieni alla Finestra. He thought Che Suave Zeffiretto so lovely that almost all our concerts had to begin with it. But he preferred the other things. The Figaro Overture was one of his favourites. There is a passage not far from the beginning of the piece, where the first violins suddenly go rocketing up into the heights of loveliness. As the music approached that point, I used always to see a smile developing and gradually brightening on Guido's face, and when, very punctually, the thing happened, he clapped his hands and laughed aloud with pleasure. On the other side of the same disc it happened was recorded Beethoven's Egmont Overture. He liked that almost better than Figaro. It has more voices, he explained, and I was delighted by the acuteness of the criticism, for it is precisely in the richness of its orchestration that Egmont goes beyond Figaro. But what stirred him almost more than anything was the Coriolan Overture. The third movement of the Fifth Symphony, the second movement of the Seventh, the slow movement of the Emperor Concerto, all these things ran it pretty close, but none excited him so much as Coriolan. One day he made me play it three or four times in succession, then he put it away. I don't think I want to hear that any more, he said. Why not? It's too, too, he hesitated. Too big, he said at last. I don't really understand it. Play me the one that goes like this. He hummed the phrase from the D minor concerto. Do you like that one better? I asked. He shook his head. No, it's not that exactly, but it's easier. Easier. It seemed to me rather a queer word to apply to Bach. I understand it better. One afternoon, while we were in the middle of our concert, Signora Bondi was ushered in. She began at once to be overwhelmingly affectionate towards the child, kissed him, patted his head, paid him the most outrageous compliments on his appearance. Guido edged away from her. And do you like music? she asked. The child nodded. I think he has a gift, I said. At any rate, he has a wonderful ear and a power of listening and criticizing such as I've never met with in a child of that age. We're thinking of hiring a piano for him to learn on. A moment later, I was cursing myself for my undue frankness in praising the boy.
for Signora Bondi began immediately to protest that if she could have the upbringing of the child, she would give him the best masters, bring out his talent, make an accomplished maestro of him, and on the way, an infant prodigy. And at that moment, I am sure, she saw herself sitting maternally in pearls and black satin in the lee of the huge Steinway, while an angelic Guido, dressed like little Lord Fauntleroy, rattled out Liszt and Chopin, to the loud delight of a thronged auditorium. She saw the bouquets and all the elaborate floral tributes, heard the clapping and the few well-chosen words with which the veteran maestri, touched almost to tears, would hail the coming of the little genius. It became more than ever important for her to acquire the child. You've sent her away fairly ravening, said Elizabeth, when Signora Bondi had gone. Better tell her next time that you made a mistake and that the boy's got no musical talent whatever. In due course, the piano arrived. After giving him the minimum of preliminary instruction, I let Guido loose on it. He began by picking out for himself the melodies he had heard, reconstructing the harmonies in which they were embedded. After a few lessons, he understood the rudiments of musical notation and could read a simple passage at sight, albeit very slowly. The whole process of reading was still strange to him. He had picked up his letters somehow, but nobody had yet taught him to read whole words and sentences. I took occasion, next time I saw Signora Bondi, to assure her that Guido had disappointed me. There was nothing in his musical talent, really. She professed to be very sorry to hear it, but I could see that she didn't for a moment believe me. Probably she thought that we were after the child, too, and wanted to bag the infant prodigy for ourselves before she could get in her claim, thus depriving her of what she regarded almost as her feudal right. For after all, weren't they her peasants? If anyone was to profit by adopting the child, it ought to be herself. Tactfully, diplomatically, she renewed her negotiations with Carlo. The boy, she put it to him, had genius. It was the foreign gentleman who had told her so, and he was the sort of man, clearly, who knew about such things. If Carlo would let her adopt the child, she'd have him trained. He'd become a great maestro and get engagements in the Argentine and the United States, in Paris and London. He'd earn millions and millions. Think of Caruso, for example. Part of the millions, she explained, would of course come to Carlo. But before they began to roll in, those millions the boy would have to be trained. But training was very expensive. In his own interest, as well as in that of his son, he ought to let her take charge of the child. Carlo said he would think it over, and again applied to us for advice. We suggested that it would be best in any case to wait a little and see what progress the boy made. He made, in spite of my assertions to Signora Bondi, excellent progress. Every afternoon, while Robin was asleep, he came for his concert and his lesson. He was getting along famously with his reading. His small fingers were acquiring strength and agility. But what to me was more interesting was that he had begun to make up little pieces on his own account. A few of them I took down as he played them, and I have them still. Most of them, strangely enough, as I thought then, are canons. He had had a passion for canons. When I explained to him the principles of the form he was enchanted, it is beautiful, he said with admiration. Beautiful, beautiful, and so easy. Again, the word surprised me. The canon is not, after all, so conspicuously simple. Thenceforward, he spent most of his time at the piano in working out little canons for his own amusement. They were often remarkably ingenious. But in the invention of other kinds of music, he did not show himself so fertile as I had hoped. He composed and harmonized one or two solemn little airs like hymn tunes with a few sprightlier pieces in the spirit of the military march. They were extraordinary, of course, as being the inventions of a child. But a great many children can do extraordinary things. We are all geniuses up to the age of ten. But I had hoped that Guido was a child who was going to be a genius at forty, in which case what was extraordinary for an ordinary child was not extraordinary enough for him. He's hardly a Mozart, we agreed, as we played his little pieces over. I felt, must be confessed, almost aggrieved.
Anything less than a Mozart, it seemed to me, was hardly worth thinking about. He was not a Mozart, no, but he was somebody, as I was to find out, quite as extraordinary. It was one morning in the early summer that I made the discovery. I was sitting in the warm shade of our westward-facing balcony, working. Guido and Robin were playing in the little enclosed garden below. Absorbed in my work, it was only, I suppose, after the silence had prolonged itself a considerable time that I became aware that the children were making remarkably little noise. There was no shouting, no running about, only a quiet talking. Knowing by experience that when children are quiet, it generally means that they are absorbed in some delicious mischief. I got up from my chair and looked over the balustrade to see what they were doing. I expected to catch them dabbling in water, making a bonfire, covering themselves with tar. But what I actually saw was Guido with a burnt stick in his hand, demonstrating on the smooth paving stones of the path that the square on the hypotenuse of a right-angled triangle is equal to the sum of the squares on the other two sides. Kneeling on the floor, he was drawing with the point of his blackened stick on the flagstones, and Robin, kneeling imitatively beside him, was growing, I could see, rather impatient with this very slow game. Guido, he said, but Guido paid no attention. Pensively frowning, he went on with his diagram. Guido! The younger child bent down and then craned round his neck so as to look up into Guido's face. Why don't you draw a train? Afterwards, said Guido. But I just want to show you this first. It's so beautiful, he added cajolingly. But I want a train, Robin persisted. In a moment. Do just wait a moment. The tone was almost imploring. Robin armed himself with renewed patience. A minute later, Guido had finished both his diagrams. There, he said triumphantly, and straightened himself up to look at them. Now I'll explain. And he proceeded to prove the theorem of Pythagoras, not in Euclid's way, but by the simpler and more satisfying method which was, in all probability, employed by Pythagoras himself. He had drawn a square and dissected it by a pair of crossed perpendiculars into two squares and two equal rectangles. The equal rectangles he divided up by their diagonals into four equal right-angled triangles. The two squares are then seen to be the squares on the two sides of any one of these triangles other than the hypotenuse. So much for the first diagram. In the next, he took the four right-angled triangles into which the rectangles had been divided and rearranged them round the original square, so that their right angles filled the corners of the square, the hypotenuses looked inwards, and the greater and less sides of the triangles were in continuation along the sides of the square, which are each equal to the sum of these sides. In this way, the original square is redissected into four right-angled triangles and the square on the hypotenuse. The four triangles are equal to the two rectangles of the original dissection. Therefore, the square on the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the two squares, the squares on the other two sides, into which, with the rectangles, the original square was first dissected. In very untechnical language, but clearly, and with a relentless logic, Guido expounded his proof. Robin listened, with an expression on his bright, freckled face of perfect incomprehension. Treno, he repeated from time to time. Treno, make a train. In a moment, Guido implored. Wait a moment, but do just look at this. Do. He coaxed and cajoled. It's so beautiful. It's so easy. So easy. The theorem of Pythagoras seemed to explain for me Guido's musical predilections. It was not an infant Mozart we had been cherishing. It was a little Archimedes with, like most of his kind, an incidental musical twist. Treno! Treno! shouted Robin, growing more and more restless as the exposition went on. And when Guido insisted on going on with his proof, he lost his temper. Cattivo Guido! he shouted, and began to hit out at him with his fists. All right, said Guido resignedly. I'll make a train and with his stick of charcoal he began to scribble on the stones. I looked on for a moment in silence. It was not a very good train. 
Guido might be able to invent for himself and prove the theorem of Pythagoras, but he was not much of a draftsman. Guido, I called. The two children turned and looked up. Who taught you to draw those squares? It was conceivable, of course, that somebody might have taught him. Nobody. He shook his head. Then, rather anxiously, as though he were afraid there might be something wrong about drawing squares, he went on to apologize and explain. You see, he said, it seemed to me so beautiful, because those squares, he pointed at the two small squares in the first figure, are just as big as this one. And indicating the square on the hypotenuse in the second diagram, he looked up at me with a deprecating smile. I nodded. Yes, it's very beautiful, I said. It's very beautiful indeed. An expression of delighted relief appeared on his face. He laughed with pleasure. You see, it's like this, he went on, eager to initiate me into the glorious secret he had discovered. You cut these two long squares, he meant the rectangles, into two slices, and then there are four slices, all just the same, because, because, oh, I ought to have said that before, because these long squares are the same, because those lines, you see. But I want a train, protested Robin. Leaning on the rail of the balcony, I watched the children below. I thought of the extraordinary thing I had just seen, and of what it meant. I thought of the vast differences between human beings. We classify men by the color of their eyes and hair, the shape of their skulls. Would it not be more sensible to divide them up into intellectual species? There would be even wider gulfs between the extreme mental types than between a Bushman and a Scandinavian. This child, I thought, when he grows up, will be to me, intellectually, what a man is to a dog. And there are other men and women who are, perhaps, almost as dogs to me. Perhaps the men of genius are the only true men. In all the history of the race, there have been only a few thousand real men. And the rest of us, what are we? Teachable animals. Without the help of the real men, we should have found out almost nothing at all. Almost all the ideas with which we are familiar could never have occurred to minds like ours. Plant the seeds there and they will grow. But our minds could never spontaneously have generated them. There have been whole nations of dogs, I thought, whole epochs in which no man was born. From the dull Egyptians, the Greeks took crude experience and rules of thumb and made sciences. More than a thousand years passed before Archimedes had a comparable successor. There has been only one Buddha, one Jesus, only one Bach that we know of, one Michelangelo. Is it by a mere chance, I wondered, that a man is born from time to time? What causes a whole constellation of them to come contemporaneously into being and from out of a single people? Taine thought that Leonardo, Michelangelo and Raphael were born when they were because the time was ripe for great painters and the Italian scene congenial. In the mouth of a rationalising 19th century Frenchman, the doctrine is strangely mystical. It may be nonetheless true for that. But what of those born out of time? Blake, for example. What of those? This child, I thought, has had the fortune to be born at a time when he will be able to make good use of his capacities. He will find the most elaborate analytical methods lying ready to his hand. He will have a prodigious experience behind him. Suppose him born while Stonehenge was building? He might have spent a lifetime discovering the rudiments, guessing darkly where now he might have had a chance of proving. Born at the time of the Norman Conquest, he would have had to wrestle with all the preliminary difficulties created by an inadequate symbolism. It would have taken him long years, for example, to learn the art of dividing MMMCCLXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
They were trotting round and round, with blown round cheeks and pouting mouth, like the cherubic symbol of a wind, Robin puff-puffed, and Guido, holding the skirt of his smock, shuffled behind him, tooting. They ran forward, backed, stopped at imaginary stations, shunted, roared over bridges, crashed through tunnels, met with occasional collisions and derailments. The young Archimedes seemed to be just as happy as the little toe-headed barbarian. A few minutes ago, he had been busy with the theorem of Pythagoras. Now, tooting indefatigably along imaginary rails, he was perfectly content to shuffle backwards and forwards among the flower beds between the pillars of the loggia in and out of the dark tunnels of the laurel tree. The fact that one is going to be Archimedes does not prevent one from being an ordinary cheerful child, meanwhile. I thought of this strange talent distinct and separate from the rest of the mind, independent, almost, of experience. The typical child prodigies are musical and mathematical. The other talents ripen slowly under the influence of emotional experience and growth. Till he was thirty, Balzac gave proof of nothing but ineptitude. But at four, the young Mozart was already a musician, and some of Pascal's most brilliant work was done before he was out of his teens. In the weeks that followed, I alternated the daily piano lessons with lessons in mathematics. Hints rather than lessons they were, for I only made suggestions, indicated methods, and left the child himself to work out the ideas in detail. Thus, I introduced him to algebra by showing him another proof of the theorem of Pythagoras. In this proof, one drops a perpendicular from the right angle onto the hypotenuse, and arguing from the fact that the two triangles thus created are similar to one another and to the original triangle, and that the proportions, which their corresponding sides bear to one another, are therefore equal, one can show in algebraical form that C2 plus D2, the squares on the other two sides, are equal to a 2 plus B2, the squares on the two segments of the hypotenuse, plus 2AB, which last, it is easy to show geometrically, is equal to a plus B2, or the square on the hypotenuse. Guido was as much enchanted by the rudiments of algebra as he would have been if I had given him an engine worked by steam with a methylated spirit lamp to heat the boiler. More enchanted, perhaps, for the engine would have got broken and, remaining always itself, would in any case have lost its charm, while the rudiments of algebra continued to grow and blossom in his mind with an unfailing luxuriance. Every day he made the discovery of something which seemed to him exquisitely beautiful. The new toy was inexhaustible in its potentialities. In the intervals of applying algebra to the second book of Euclid, we experimented with circles. We stuck bamboos into the parched earth, measured their shadows at different hours of the day, and drew exciting conclusions from our observations. Sometimes, for fun, we cut and folded sheets of paper so as to make cubes and pyramids. One afternoon, Guido arrived carrying carefully between his small and rather grubby hands a flimsy dodecahedron. A tantabello, he said, as he showed us his paper crystal. And when I asked him how he had managed to make it, he merely smiled and said it had been so easy. I looked at Elizabeth and laughed, but it would have been more symbolically to the point I felt if I had gone down on all fours, wagged the spiritual outgrowth of my O.S. Coxix, and barked my astonished admiration. It was an uncommonly hot summer. By the beginning of July, our little Robin, unaccustomed to these high temperatures, began to look pale and tired. He was listless, had lost his appetite and energy. The doctor advised mountain air. We decided to spend the next ten or twelve weeks in Switzerland. My parting gift to Guido was the first six books of Euclid in Italian. He turned over the pages, looking ecstatically at the figures. If only I knew how to read properly, he said. I'm so stupid, but now I shall really try to learn. From our hotel near Grindelwald, we sent the child, in Robin's name, various postcards of cows, alphorns, Swiss chalets, Edelweiss and the like. We received no answers to these cards, but then we did not expect answers. Guido could not write, 
and there was no reason why his father or his sisters should take the trouble to write for him. No news, we took it, was good news. And then, one day, early in September, there arrived at the hotel a strange letter. The manager had it stuck up on the glass-fronted notice board in the hall so that all the guests might see it, and whoever conscientiously thought that it belonged to him might claim it. Passing the board on the way into lunch, Elizabeth stopped to look at it. But it must be from Guido, she said. I came and looked at the envelope over her shoulder. It was unstamped and black with postmarks. Traced out in pencil, the big uncertain capital letters sprawled across its face. In the first line was written, Al Babo D. Robin, and there followed a travestied version of the name of the hotel and the place. Round the address, bewildered, postal officials had scrawled, suggested emendations. The letter had wandered for a fortnight at least, back and forth across the face of Europe. Al Babo di Robin, to Robin's father. I laughed. Pretty smart of the postman to have got it here at all. I went to the manager's office, set forth the justice of my claim to the letter, and having paid the fifty centime surcharge for the missing stamp, had the case unlocked and the letter given me. We went into lunch. The writing's magnificent, we agreed laughing as we examined the address at close quarters. Thanks to Euclid, I added. That's what comes of pandering to the ruling passion. But when I opened the envelope and looked at its contents, I no longer laughed. The letter was brief and almost telegraphical in style. Sono dalla padrona, it ran. Non mi piace, ha rubato il mio libro. Non voglio suonare più voglio tornare a casa. Venga subito guido. What is it? I handed Elizabeth the letter. That blasted woman's got hold of him, I said. Busts of men in Homburg hats, angels bathed in marble tears extinguishing torches, statues of little girls, cherubs, veiled figures, allegories and ruthless realisms. The strangest and most diverse idols beckoned and gesticulated as we passed. Printed indelibly on tin and embedded in the living rock, the brown photographs looked out under glass from the humbler crosses, headstones and broken pillars. Dead ladies in the cubistic geometrical fashions of thirty years ago, two cones of black satin meeting point to point at the waist and the arms, a sphere to the elbow, a polished cylinder below, smiled mournfully out of their marble frames. The smiling faces, The white hands were the only recognizably human things that emerged from the solid geometry of their clothes. Men with black moustaches, men with white beards, young, clean-shaven men stared or averted their gaze to show a Roman profile. Children in their stiff best opened wide their eyes, smiled hopefully in anticipation of the little bird that was to issue from the camera's muzzle, smiled sceptically in the knowledge that it wouldn't, smiled laboriously and obediently because they had been told to. In spiky Gothic cottages of marble, the richer dead privately reposed. Through grilled doors, one caught a glimpse of pale inconsolables weeping, of distraught geniuses guarding the secret of the tomb. The less prosperous sections of the majority slept in communities, close crowded, but elegantly housed under smooth, continuous marble floors whose every flagstone was the mouth of a separate grave. These continental cemeteries, I thought, as Carlo and I made our way among the dead, are more frightful than ours, because these people pay more attention to their dead than we do. That primordial cult of corpses, that tender solicitude for their material well-being, which led the ancients to house their dead in stone, while they themselves lived between wattles and under thatch, still lingers here. Persists, I thought, more vigorously than with us. There are a hundred gesticulating statues here for everyone in an English graveyard. There are more family vaults, more luxuriously appointed, as they say of liners and hotels, than one would find at home. And embedded in every tombstone, There are photographs to remind the powdered bones within what form they will have to resume on the Day of Judgment. Beside each are little hanging lamps to burn optimistically on All Souls' Day. To the man who built the pyramids, they are nearer, I thought, than we. If I had known, Carlo kept repeating, 
If only I had known. His voice came to me through my reflections as though from a distance. At the time, he didn't mind at all. How should I have known that he would take it so much to heart afterwards? And she deceived me. She lied to me. I assured him yet once more that it wasn't his fault, though of course it was in part. It was mine too in part. I ought to have thought of the possibility and somehow guarded against it. And he shouldn't have let the child go, even temporarily and on trial, even though the woman was bringing pressure to bear on him. And the pressure had been considerable. They had worked on the same holding for more than a hundred years, the men of Carlo's family. And now she had made the old man threaten to turn him out. It would be a dreadful thing to leave the place. And besides, another place wasn't so easy to find. It was made quite plain, however, that he could stay if he let her have the child. Only for a little to begin with, just to see how he got on. There would be no compulsion whatever on him to stay if he didn't like it. And it would be all to Guido's advantage, and to his father's too, in the end. All that the Englishman had said about his not being such a good musician as he had thought at first was obviously untrue. Mere jealousy and little-mindedness. The man wanted to take credit for Guido himself, that was all. And the boy, it was obvious, would learn nothing from him. What he needed was a real good professional master. All the energy that, if the physicists had known their business, would have been driving dynamos, went into this campaign. It began the moment we were out of the house, intensively. She would have more chance of success, the Signora doubtless thought, if we weren't there. And besides, it was essential to take the opportunity when it offered itself, and get hold of the child before. We could make our bid, for it was obvious to her that we wanted Guido just as much as she did. Day after day, she renewed the assault. At the end of a week, she sent her husband to complain about the state of the vines. They were in a shocking condition. He had decided, or very nearly decided, to give Carlo notice. Meekly, shamefacedly, in obedience to higher orders, the old gentleman uttered his threats. Next day, Signora Bondi returned to the attack. The padrone, she declared, had been in a towering passion but she'd do her best, her very best, to mollify him. And after a significant pause, she went on to talk about Guido. In the end, Carlo gave in. The woman was too persistent, and she held too many trump cards. The child could go and stay with her for a month or two on trial. After that, if he really expressed a desire to remain with her, she could formally adopt him. At the idea of going for a holiday to the seaside, and it was to the seaside, Signora Bondi told him, that they were going. Guido was pleased and excited. He had heard a lot about the sea from Robin. Tanta aqua! It had sounded almost too good to be true, and now he was actually to go and see this marvel. It was very cheerfully that he parted from his family. But after the holiday by the sea was over, and Signora Bondi had brought him back to her townhouse in Florence, he began to be homesick. The signora, it was true, treated him exceedingly kindly, bought him new clothes, took him out to tea in the Via Tornabuoni, and filled him up with cakes, iced strawberry aid, whipped cream, and chocolates. But she made him practice the piano more than he liked, and what was worse, she took away his Euclid on the score that he wasted too much time with it. And when he said that he wanted to go home, she put him off with promises and excuses and downright lies. She told him that she couldn't take him at once, but that next week, if he were good and worked hard at his piano meanwhile, next week. And when the time came, she told him that his father didn't want him back, and she redoubled her petting, gave him expensive presents, and stuffed him with yet unhealthier foods. To no purpose. Guido didn't like his new life, didn't want to practice scales, pined for his book, and longed to be back with his brothers and sisters. Signora Bondi, meanwhile, continued to hope that time and chocolates would eventually make the child hers, and to keep his family at a distance, she wrote to Carlo every few days letters which still purported to come from the seaside. She took the trouble to send them to a friend, who posted them back again to Florence, and in which she painted the most charming picture of Guido's happiness. It was then 
that Guido wrote his letter to me, abandoned, as he supposed, by his family, for that they shouldn't take the trouble to come to see him when they were so near was only to be explained on the hypothesis that they really had given him up. He must have looked to me as his last and only hope, and the letter, with its fantastic address, had been nearly a fortnight on its way. A fortnight? It must have seemed hundreds of years, and as the centuries succeeded one another, gradually, no doubt, the poor child became convinced that I, too, had abandoned him. There was no hope left. Here we are, said Carlo. I looked up and found myself confronted by an enormous monument, in a kind of grotto hollowed in the flanks of a monolith of grey sandstone, sacred love, in bronze, was embracing a funerary urn, and in bronze letters riveted into the stone was a long legend to the effect that the inconsolable Ernesto Bondi had raised this monument to the memory of his beloved wife, Annunziata, as a token of his undying love for one whom, snatched from him by a premature death, he hoped very soon to join beneath this stone. The first Signora Bondi had died in 1912. I thought of the old man leashed to his white dog. He must always, I reflected, have been a most uxorious husband. They buried him here. We stood there for a long time in silence. I felt the tears coming into my eyes as I thought of the poor child lying there underground. I thought of those luminous grave eyes and the curve of that beautiful forehead, the droop of the melancholy mouth of the expression of delight which illumined his face when he learned of some new idea that pleased him when he heard a piece of music that he liked. And this beautiful small being was dead, and the spirit that inhabited this form, the amazing spirit that too had been destroyed almost before it had begun to exist and the unhappiness that must have preceded the final act, the child's despair, the conviction of his utter abandonment, those were terrible to think of, terrible. I think we had better come away now, I said at last, and touched Carlo on the arm. He was standing there like a blind man, his eyes shut, his face slightly lifted towards the light. From between his closed eyelids the tears welled out, hung for a moment, and trickled down his cheeks. His lips trembled, and I could see that he was making an effort to keep them still. Come away, I repeated. The face which had been still in its sorrow was suddenly convulsed. He opened his eyes, and through the tears they were bright with a violent anger. I shall kill her, he said. I shall kill her. When I think of him throwing himself out, falling through the air. With his two hands he made a violent gesture bringing them down from over his head and arresting them with a sudden jerk when they were on a level with his breast. And then crash! He shuddered. She's as much responsible as though she had pushed him down herself. I shall kill her. He clenched his teeth. To be angry is easier than to be sad, less painful. It is comforting to think of revenge. Don't talk like that, I said. It's no good. It's stupid. And what would be the point? He had had those fits before, when grief became too painful, and he had tried to escape from it. Anger had been the easiest way of escape. I had had, before this, to persuade him back into the harder path of grief. It's stupid to talk like that, I repeated, and I led him away through the ghastly labyrinth of tombs, where death seemed more terrible even than it is. By the time we had left the cemetery and were walking down from San Miniato towards the Piazzale Michelangelo below, he had become calmer. His anger had subsided again into the sorrow from which it had derived all its strength and its bitterness. In the Piazzale we halted for a moment to look down at the city in the valley below us. It was a day of floating clouds, great shapes, white, golden and grey, and between them patches of a thin, transparent blue, its lantern level almost with our eyes, the dome of the cathedral revealed itself in all its grandiose lightness, its vastness and aerial strength. On the innumerable brown and rosy roofs of the city the afternoon sunlight lay softly, sumptuously, and the towers were as though varnished and enamelled with an old gold 
I thought of all the men who had lived here and left the visible traces of their spirit and conceived extraordinary things. I thought of the dead child, 